So super excited to introduce our guest today. She's someone that I've been following, both of us have been following for years. Um, in fact, I read The Mistress's Daughter in The New Yorker, and it was the first time someone else's adoption experience resonated really deeply with me. And so I became a big fan. Um, I'm excited to introduce A.M. Holmes. Hi. Oh, I'm excited to be here with you guys. Um, Welcome. Yes. It fi- we finally made it happen. I'm just yes, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. thrilled about it. Um, and uh, let's mention that today as this episode comes out, so does your book. Everybody get it. We'll put a link in, in, our, in our episode notes, but it's called The Unfolding and it's fantastic. So I just wanted to plug that in the beginning. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate that. So I don't have to. <laughs> well, um, yeah, go, go ahead. ahead. We're, we're kind of going to jump right in. So sure. what is your story? Why are you here as an adoptee? Well, I'm adopted. And I, as mm-hmm. I like to also tell people, I'm up for adoption again, if anyone's interested. <laughs> um, I like to keep that door open. <laughs> so uh, my story is that I, I was adopted at birth. Um, I was a private adoption in Washington, D.C. in 1961. Uh, and I grew up always knowing that I was adopted. So that that part, <laughs> that part worked out okay, um, in the sense that, you know, it wasn't something that I discovered about myself later, which I think can be a, a special thing. And then um, I would say the family I grew up in was quite complicated, which I'm happy to discuss in some ways. It's of. Uh, and then when I was about 30, I had written, I was a novelist, and I had written a book called um, In a Country of Mothers. It was a novel. And in that novel, there was a therapist who had given up a child many years ago and then decides that a new patient is the child she gave up and she kind of drives the girl crazy. And that was the first, and I would sort of say only time actually that I had sort of dealt with my elements of my real life in fiction. I'm really, really a fiction writer. So when I'm writing fiction, it's super made up. And then oddly, just as that book was about to be published um, out of the blue, uh, my, parents, my adoptive parents told me that they had gotten a call from the lawyer who had handled the the adoption and that my biological mother had seen an Oprah show where Oprah talked about adoptions and reunions and had called him and, and asked, did I want to know the information? So that's sort of what triggered, obviously, sort of the unfolding of a whole, no, no joke about the unfolding, not related to the adoption, but the unfolding of a whole other sort of if not chapter, but but section of my life where I came to find out more about my biological uh, mother and then ultimately my biological father and, and all that kind of stuff. And, you know, it, as we all know, it's a big thing to deal with. Um, did, did you, did your parents know her name? No, you know, it's interesting. I, when I was growing up, they would say to me, we know that it was important to her to be that you be adopted into a Jewish family. And again, I thought, okay, weird detail. I'm not sure what, what that matter, or is she Jewish or why that matters to her? And then they would say, we know that your father was married and your mother wasn't. So it was an affair my father was having. Um, and at some point they had some sort of little bit of information about like, I think they actually knew my biological father's last name, although that was never really clear to me. They would sort of be like, it sounds like, something like that. Um, and then I'm trying to think what else they actually knew. You know, not terribly much. And there had been a, an exchange of letters between my biological mother and my adopted mother. And I'm like, well, where are the letters? And my mother's like, I got rid of them. And I, that always still, my mother is now 96. And my biological mother passed away a long time ago. Um, that always really bummed me out because I thought, you know, I, I would like to see those letters and, and to know what you all talked about. And I don't know why she felt the need to destroy them, but the other element of it that I do know, and now weirdly in like a couple of years ago, I got my adoption file, my original adoption file, which I can tell you about, which has also happened to come to me in a very odd way. But the biological mother never signed off on my relinquishment. So my adoptive parents were really petrified for more than a year that someone was just going to come and take me away. And they had had a child who died in the family shortly before I was born. And so there was a lot of grief and a lot of complexity. And I think that was really scary for them. Uh, And ultimately they had to petition a judge to say that that they, you know, attempts had been made to contact her and that she was not responding and they couldn't get a signature. So, you know, every story- Were you the only- Yeah, Were you their only 
adopted child? I was, I am. <laughs> and, and the only child? No. So my mother had been married previously, my adoptive mother, and had a child. And that was the boy who died when he was nine years old. Mm-hmm. And she married my adoptive father when that child was probably about seven. And together they had, I have an older brother who was their biological child. Um, and so all of that was sort of unfolding and even sort of in a way, I, I guess the process to adopt me even had started before that nine-year-old died, but he had been sick, he had been ill his whole life. So that was, a, again, a very complicated story. My, fa- my adoptive father actually had adopted him um, from out of the sort of first marriage my mother had been in. And did your mom ever tell you why she got rid of the letters? What was her? I think, I mean, she, you know, yes and no. I mean, I I don't think I ever got the real answer. I think it made her nervous. I think it made her nervous that there was some documentation. Paper trail. That was sort of what she said was that the lawyer had told her at the time to get rid of any documentation. Um, And again, I don't, you know, it's so weird, right? And, And it's interesting to think about how 1960s, just the world was very different. Mm -hmm. Um, And even the conversations, as we all know, about adoption and and all of the elements of it were entirely different. And authority Um, was so big. You know, that was one thing my parents talked about was they were terrified of, you know, the agency and authority in general. Right. right. And in this case, the interesting thing was when I was older and I had a therapist, the therapist would say to me, because they used to tell my parents would say, we got you from an agency. And I would say, which one? And my therapist would say, no agency would give a family who just lost a child a new baby right away. And I was always like, that, you're right. That makes, you know, so she knew there was something that wasn't, I was being told that wasn't true. And it was a private adoption. So there was no, in a way, there was the absence of authority. Yes. Uh, I hadn't thought about that. that Yeah. Or due diligence or like, is this a good idea? (laughs) Yeah. Right. There was was no due diligence in this. It was just, you know, there's the shrouded in secrecy and shame and yes yeah absolutely hopefully we're not going back to that um (laughs) well (sighs) it's really complicated Um, and you know there's so many elements of that too because it's everything from the elements of what does it mean obviously to a woman to have a child and relinquish it which is clearly huge and then what does it mean for a family to make the choice to adopt. And there was always that, that thread of that story. I don't know if you ever saw, I used to have that book. It was two volumes in a gray slip case. I still have it called The Adopted Family. And no. oh, I'll have to find it for you guys and send you the link. Um, but there was one book that was for the parents and then one, one for the child. And, you know, there was always that thing of like, oh, people would say, you know, your parents did such a wonderful Fine. thing when they adopted you. And it's like, did they, <laughs> you know, right. <laughs> the good news and bad news is when I ultimately met my biological family, I thought they absolutely did <laughs> but <laughs> for different reasons. I mean, it's, it's an interesting burden to sort of put on the adoption to be like, oh, this is a, a really a very good deed. And it has nothing to do with you as a person, which is interesting. No. So it's, you know, there's so much pressure as a child about that. You yes. don't even know what you're absorbing. Totally. A thousand percent. I feel like I was brought in like as an infant to do a job of like a priest or something, right. in my family, you know, yeah. Yeah. to heal, like, to heal, heal this family, family that yeah. Yeah. It, it totally. is a huge burden on a, on an infant. Yes. Yeah. And I think we must know that on some cellular level. Well, yes. And the other thing I think about, and, and everyone keeps telling me, oh, you should write more about this or try to sort of do a study, you know, you always see all these numbers besides the fact that there are more serial killers who are adopted than the normal population, but the more simple stuff like learning issues and other problems. And I think there really is a problem of integration, of integration within the infant self or the young self of knowing you came into the world in a different place and knowing you came in as a different person. And I, I think, and I'm not a scientist, but I would bet everything on it that that lack of integration and the difficulty in putting those pieces together and the fact that there's no support, there's no scaffolding for that, there's no process. And it is cellular, it is both biological and psychological for how do you uh, sort of surrender one identity and absorb a new identity, you know, at a very, very early age. Yeah. And, and, verbal, and simultaneously. Yes, you know, and without that, any that, verbal, you know, or emotional skill. I mean, you know, if no, you have no training, 
My, uh, my, and back my, in that, oh, okay, well, go ahead. My mother lost a baby, um, a stillborn baby before yeah. I was born. And I yeah. didn't know that until right. I was 18 or 19 years old. And it, and even then, you know, because we came into this very late coming mm-hmm. out of the fog or any kind of mm-hmm. talking about adoption, but even then I knew there was something like a, a click, like, oh, oh, that makes sense. I'd see my mom crying sometimes well, or she, yeah could be very distant about certain things with me compared to my brother. And exactly. he didn't see that when I right. talked to him about it, he doesn't see it, but. No, and, and that's the other thing that's so yeah. confusing because yes. other people don't see it. You think, but I'm feeling it. And then therapists say, well, it. I wonder what that is about you. Do you have difficulty right. attaching? And you're thinking, no, it's there. Yeah. And, yes. you know, I mean, it's, that, but that's real. I mean, that's so it is real. real. And it's not, and it's completely that piece of it too. And it goes to everything from, you know, the laws about getting your records and all that, the adoptees experience is pretty much negated. You're just supposed to blend in and kind of make yeah. everything okay and Don't rock not the cause boat. any trouble because clearly there's already been trouble of some sort. Um, yeah. And then people would say things like to other people, like sort of like, you know, and along the lines of, and I still hear this, well, why would you want to adopt if you could have a child? And I think, well, something <laughs> that's also a thing that you think, okay, thanks. That's not so nice. Um, oh, you know, or people would say to me, are all adopted people like you, or is it just you? I was like, must be just me. You know, the, the thing about that, why would you want to adopt if you could have your own child, I think is really what people feel. And it is. And I, I think, you know, having had my own biological child, like in my, in the darkest of moments, I think, yeah, I probably would love my biological child more than another child. I mean, I, is that human nature? Is that make me a bad person? I don't know, but I really think when you strip it all down and get to the bare bones of it, that might be the truth. I would say for me, I'm not sure. And I, and I tried at one point to adopt, there was a child who had been born and left at a hospital and I tried to get that kid. Um, and I went and met the kid and I thought it's interesting. I immediately felt, yes, I could parent this child, this infant who was a little boy who was, you know, not white, all the things that, you know, and I thought, absolutely, I could do this. Um, and the interesting thing was, I think now that I also have a biological child, the interesting thing when it's not your child biologically is there is a certain kind of a distance, which I think is also beneficial to parenting, like, because you can see and you have context and perspective. The funny thing, and I don't, I'm curious, Sarah, for you, you know, this is the first biological relative I've lived with. Yeah. And she is just like me and her temper is just yeah. like mine. <laughs> and everyone will tell you it's a lot, you know, and I'm not used to that. I'm not used to anyone understanding me or getting me or reflecting yeah. me back to myself or anything. Yes. I, I, I experienced that with my son who's now 24 and uh, it, living with someone and it, start of his career and we get along great, but, but the two of us as a, I was a single parent Yeah, I mean, his father was in the picture, but we were, t- you know, and yeah, we, I was too for quite a while. Yeah. Yes. Oh, yeah. we butt yeah. heads and, and he would say to him, he's like, mom, I think you're, you're, you're reacting this way because you have abandonment issues. And, <laughs> you know, yeah. we had, and, and oh. did you resent that? Cause I resent that. Oh yeah. <laughs> yes. Of yes. course. During yeah. the time you're so resentful, my son would tell to me how it is. And I'm like, a second, you don't know me, right. <laughs> but you are, you yeah. know, and I, I hugely attached to him. Yeah. Um, in a way that his, when, when I went through empty nest, it just mm-hmm. killed me. Yeah. I mean, I'm still, it's five years later and I'm yeah. still feeling it. Um, it's it's yeah. scary how attached, right? I can't, I yeah. can't even put words on it and they feel it too. I actually, something that occurred to me when we were reading the primal wound is how much my son was like the primal wound. It's like he was adopted even though he wasn't adopted, like I've told him that. And he's like, I'm gonna have to read that because I think we do pass it down. Totally. The way I parented, I didn't know I was parenting that way, but I think I parented with that abandonment fear. Like, don't go, oh my gosh. A thousand percent, a thousand Mm -hmm. percent. And I feel, it's funny to say like, I don't want to say I feel bad about it, but I feel bad about it. Yeah, Mm -hmm. Um, I feel bad about it. Because I can see the ways in which, for lack of a better word, the injuries of, of my experience as a child Absolutely, are played out on my kid. Absolutely. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And you think you're, you think you're doing no it better? That yeah. doesn't. 
you know. Yeah. There's no, what'd you say? There's no experience of parenting or growing up where your parents don't act out what happened in their childhood on you in some way. And right. that is unfortunately what happens. I mean, even, you know, puppies and dogs, you know, yeah. whatever. I mean, it's complicated, but, yes. but I was so, I'm so aware of it. And then it's funny because we're part of the fight this morning we were talking about, she's like, you know, you shouldn't have put me in therapy when I was like little. And I said, you're totally <laughs> right. And I said, you know, we went to therapy when you were really little, because I was worried about having attachment problems. And then I realized, you know, I could just stay home and play with the kid rather than take her to therapy as a teacher, right? <laughs> and talk, like hold her and talk to someone about my attachment problems. I said, you're a thousand percent right. Um, yeah. But I was, I, think, really, I was really anxious about that. I think half of it is validating things too. I, you know, yeah. my therapist once told me my son kind of unloaded on me mm-hmm. after divorce and everything, just this barrage of why both he and his father, myself and his father were both very unattached to, you know, had abandonment. He has his own abandonment. They love, to, they love to do that. They love to get you all, like you get, he, you get it for everyone. You get everyone. It. And yeah. he, yes. I remember him just giving me the, like, what for? And yeah. I texted my therapist during it. And she said, just listen and really just take yourself out of it and validate. And it was the best. I remember, I remember thinking, okay, like really, if someone had listened to me, right. I tried to look at that. It's so difficult. Yeah. It's so difficult. Yeah. No one listened to us. No. Yeah. <laughs> but that's also generational. I mean, that yes. was, you know, no, they were not, it's everything. were not supposed to, they weren't expected to listen. That would have been crazy. If someone's parent were listening, you would have thought the lady was weird, right? You'd be like, Oh, this is so-and-so such a good listener. Yeah. You know, <laughs> that never, right. Can you it's, imagine if you went to a it, friend's house and I'd like, cookies and their mom was like tell me more about yourself like, the best thing you said there's mrs so-and-so because yeah. who, yeah. who does that anymore either I, I still do I still I have too. older people who live in my apartment building and stuff and I'm like mr so-and-so and they're like you cannot do that anymore I'm like I cannot stop <laughs> and my daughter does it to them too because she's like oh. you know it's respect it's respect and they're 80 you know? yeah <laughs> Yeah. Well, it is. It's a little bit, we got into the whole, like the first name thing. It's yes, so, totally. so, that's a whole, a whole parent. Our, our Gen X. Yeah. <laughs> so, okay. So yeah. let's, let's go back. So you get this letter, your parents tell you they get a phone yeah. call or a letter from the lawyer. Yeah. Your, your birth mother has watched Oprah. <laughs> <laughs> that tells a lot right there. <laughs> um, <laughs> I think Oprah owes me that she should pick one of my books for her book club. She should. I can't I have believe she has a lot. <laughs> I can't believe she hasn't, to be honest with I you. I know, right? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, but yeah, so I got this. I, I, then my parents sort of said, do you want to know? And I remember, I mean, I really was caught off guard. And I thought, I wrote about this in The Mistress's Daughter. The strangest piece of it was that feeling that how could there be something that somebody knows about me that I don't know about myself? Mm. And that super disconcerting um and so i that and then i had to sort of figure out and sort of inch my way towards you know this information and i remember you know quite a while before this when i was writing the the novel in a country of mothers and i was talking to bj lifton about all this stuff and i took a course with her at the new school in new york and she was of the mind that if people didn't go looking for their adoptive or their birth parents that they were sort of holding off a kind of information that it was very important to make that search. And I remember thinking, I'm not so sure that everybody needs to make that search. It doesn't necessarily mean the same thing to everybody. And I used to say sort of jokingly, if someone wanted to hand me the information, I would accept it, but I wasn't gonna go in search of it. Or I didn't feel the need to. And then all of a sudden there was somebody like trying to hand me the information. I was like, well, you know, I don't know. <laughs> um, and I will say it, it is surprising to me how disorienting that is uh so that information and and the key piece of it too so you know as a writer as someone who traffics in story right and narrative it became so clear to me how much of our identity is a story right so every family has its story every obviously every adoptee has its story and this you kind of tell yourself oh i came from here i was this now i'm that or my family is this kind of family and blah 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 and there's always people within a family who don't subscribe to the story and they're called the black sheep right because they're like i don't buy that story that's not what happened with aunt so and so or uncle so and so was a drinker and used to hit aunt so and so and no one talks about you know there's always sort of the the secret truth teller that everyone discounts and pushes away 
And so, yeah, exactly. <laughs> which is a thing. So it was interesting to me to feel on a very almost like physical level the the shattering of my story, right? That my story was changing and I in some ways had no control over it. And it was no longer a story that anyone could tell to me because no one really knew, you know, there were multiple players in the story and each player had a different piece of it. And so that that was really, I would say for me, that was the biggest, um, I don't want to say it's surprise, but it really caused a sort of dissembling of self and of identity, I would say. I had, I didn't search either. And I had information given to me at 32 years old and right. I didn't exactly. look at it. I didn't look at it for a week. It's yeah. on my counter and I literally, and my ex-husband would say, aren't you going to open that? Nope. Yeah, exactly. I, I didn't, I was scared of it. Of course. And it, it is it, scary. Yeah. The way you, you describe it, I haven't heard. And that's very yeah. true. Well, and you, you think about it, you think it is scary because you think, what is this going to do to me? How will this change me? How will this change my relationship to other people? And you can't, you don't know. It, uh, once again, all the responsibility is laid on our shoulders for, exactly. you yeah. know, I mean, yeah. for processing to, us to navigate. Exactly. Yeah. 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 Old souls. That's what adoptees are. I feel like yes. they're all old souls. Yeah. Cause there are many souls. In yeah. There are many yeah. souls. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 Exactly. It makes, and how, how is your relationship with your brother? Like, how was he in the family? Are you close now, your brother? My brother, um, my brother is somewhat complicated. He is disabled um, and sort of uh, has um, emotional issues and stuff. And it, I would say it's, it is complicated. He, so, and his relationship to my mother is very entwined and very close. And I always, in some ways, I think resented it. Um, and he had a very complicated birth. He almost died, which is then she had a hysterectomy, which is why she couldn't have more children, which is theoretically why I'm adopted and all this stuff. So I would say complicated. I mean, I talk to I talk to my family every day, probably multiple times a day. And I'm sort of in a way, I'm not, I mean, he doesn't require my care overtly, although he recently had a health event where I had to go down there and, and really care for him. So it's it's complicated. But you know, I'm super responsible. Of course. <laughs> and very reliable. So. Yeah. <laughs> That's I would fun hope so. Me, right? I would hope so. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. How about you guys? <laughs> you know? uh, it brings up a lot of things what you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I'm sure. I know. We, we've been I, I did go, I did go searching, but as you guys were both talking, I was thinking about how I went about that search and how I spent most of my life being, keeping everything at a distance. So yeah. even when I searched, I didn't have an emotional attachment mm -hmm. to it. it. It just, I've been shut. I was shut down for so long. And, yeah. um, but I did go searching when, when, when I was pregnant, I just thought, well, I would like to know the, the right. information on a side note, when you were talking about getting your adoption records recently, I finally sent away for my birth certificate and mm -hmm. I, I did have my adoption decree on it, which says my, what I thought was my birth name, that my birth mother had told me what's in the adoption decree, Donna Lynn, blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. Um, and everywhere throughout the adoption decree, it says that I get my original birth certificate and it's a completely different name. Really? Yes, and I have totally no name. idea. <laughs> so I have three names. Wow. I have no idea what the truth is or how that happened because all parties Who put the are... name on there. Mm -hmm. It's bizarre. Well, it's funny too, that you say that because I used to sort of play this game of like, I'm going to apply for my birth certificate using what I think my birth name was and see if I get the original birth certificate. Like <laughs> if somehow they just look up and go, oh yeah, like that, that name is right here. Let's just send that one instead of the, you know, the amended one. Cause I, I think like, you know, we all see how well bureaucracies function. What's to say that the file is really sealed or that anything's anywhere, right? Um. <laughs> we had a guest that broke into the adoption record place. Yeah. And, and stole her, stole, stole and, and she had all these adoptee records. It always makes me think of that, just her standing there. And it was like, just, it was just sitting on a floor in right. a box behind a desk, yeah. literally. Not cared for, not a- not, Yeah, exactly. 
she's holding all these people's lives and then she took it back we're like did you take it back she's like i took it back yeah she, she, like scan it before she took it back this is back, microfish days yeah oh, right. a, lot of, <laughs> zero, a lot of xeroxing I think right lots of yeah. <laughs> public library for hours <laughs> it's like the pentagon yeah. papers what was yeah. your birth name do you know your birth name um i do and I, I probably won't say publicly just because mm -hmm. for lots of reasons that have nothing to do with adoption, but everything to do with the rest of my life. But the one detail I will tell you that is so weird about it is that the same name that was my birth name was the name that my adoptive mother was going to name me. And I came home with a bracelet with that name on it. And she was just coldly freaked out. I was like, that's not going to happen. Um, and then the weirder thing is when I got the adoption file, my birth num mother had checked into the hospital under a false name and had used that same name. And so, you know, clearly it had some meaning to her that I never was able to ask her about, but I thought that was all pretty interesting. And then I will tell you on a further annoyance, when my now biological child is very angry with me, she will call me that name. <laughs> and I have said to her, that is not okay. Yeah. There are some things that you could do and some things you can't do. And that, that piece of information you need to know is not yours to use sort of as a weapon. She's a smart cookie. They, they get you, they have all the key, all of them. Like, you know, what, what I find with my son um, is he is the only person I think on the planet where I feel completely comfortable that, that he knows me and to be myself that yes. I, it, if that makes sense. Um, it totally makes sense. I would say that, the, that, that this child and it, that piece is, I think, super interesting for people who grow up with no biological relatives. That child knows me in ways that, that are absence of language. I mean, they, mm. they actually, there is a level of understanding that is really primitive and cellular. And, you know, you, can, you, can't, you can't otherwise make, you know, at home. You just can't. Um, no. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> It's, okay, I so I do, I, I want to hear your stories. Yes. <laughs> I want to hear about your biological parents and, and all that um, happened once you yeah. got that. So, and, and I did, for, for people who are listening, if they're interested, read The Mistress's Daughter. Yes, it actually it, it does a much better job of telling it than I in my ripe old age so many years later too. But I will say, so then um, I ultimately contacted and spoke to uh, my biological mother, who was really a handful. Um, and it's interesting too, what prompts somebody at what point in their life to go and try to find this, their child or to kind of, I would say in her case, in some way of desire to recapture a life that she didn't have. Um, and so there was that piece of it and she very much wanted to see me immediately. And I was like, you know, this is going to take me a minute. And then I was, had a book that, uh, country mothers was coming out. And she said, can I come to the bookstore? I said, please do not come to the bookstore. You know, I need to be able to do my job. I have a professional life and a public life. And I need to, that's, that's different and that's separate. And of course she shows up at the bookstore in Washington, DC, where my whole family is, my fourth grade teacher, my friends from junior high. And I had brilliantly, and I write about this in, in Mr. Sister's Daughter, but I had somehow the day, like a day or two before all of this, stuck a newspaper in my eye. Like I was reading the paper and I cut my cornea. And in those days they used to put like a patch on, it was like a maxi pad, <laughs> like a maxi pad on one eye. And I'm trying to do my reading for my book. And the other eye was just sympathetically like closing. I was like, we're out of here. <laughs> um, so I start my book tour. They're like, every day you have to go see an eye doctor in whatever city and you have to take this patch off. And it was like, it wasn't even like you cut your cornea with one piece. I like shredded it or something. Oh. And so I had this giant thing and I was like, in the beginning <laughs> and then at the end of the reading I'm still like you know like in the, to the audience like and everyone of course is what she and she comes up to me and I see her coming right I see this person and I just know it's her from the vibe and the whole thing not that I can even really see but you can just feel it right and the first thing she says to me is what did you do to your eye and then I said <laughs> What are you doing? You're not <laughs> like, it's like really both equally charming on both ends. And I saw my, by my adoptive mother seeing this. And I thought, I felt very protective. And I said, there's people here whose privacy I have to protect. I can't, I cannot talk with you right now. Um, 
And, and then at some point she went like, you know, flying out of the bookstore and my mother looked completely shaken and, and went and she was talking to her friend, my junior high school b- girlfriend who had been like, you know, looking out at me, literally turned into a bookcase. <laughs> <This was never laughs> she was like, I don't know what that was. And then I had to go and do like, mm-hmm. you know, in the basement of the book for some like giant radio interview, like an NPR thing. And I'm like, oh, oh. and I'm completely like, <laughs> like whatever. That is a, that's a lot. That's a lot. (laughs) Yes. I can't even imagine trying to keep it together during that. Well, it sounds like having, you know, read, um, we're at the advantage of having read it, but um, a lack of boundaries on her part, maybe mental illness or. Hard to know exactly, but definitely a lack of boundaries. And um, yeah. And I think in some ways, if not overtly a mental illness, almost a kind of, um, lack of development as a person Mm. in some ways that, you know, not very, in some ways, not very sort of sophisticated and not very aware. Um, And importantly, in terms of adoption, not thinking about what was, what did I need, right? And as we all know, as parents, it's not, I mean, by virtue of the fact that I'm in the basement right now, it's not about (laughs) what we need, right? Right. And as adoptees, it's never about what you need. And obviously as a woman, it's 900% mostly, not what you want or need, right? So mm-hmm. it's it's a very complicated dance and situation. I think even that in terms of it, it's interesting to hear you talk about your sons because I feel like having a daughter is for like it's more been more dangerous for me um, because I'm in this situation where I and I remember when before she was born and I found out I was having a girl, I thought, oh my god, I hope I don't give birth to my mother, um, and I wasn't afraid of that in terms of a boy. It, it, that is interesting you say that because I was a little bit terrified of having a girl. Yeah, I was too. See, or, yeah, <laughs> that's so cool because I've too. never heard anyone say that. But yeah. yes, terrifying. I mean, I would have been, of course, overjoyed and all those things. Yes, but exactly. deep in my psyche, yes, I was yes. very nervous about having a girl. Petrified. Yeah. I was too, and I I had grown up with brothers. I was the oldest yeah. of of three, so I and had to take care of them exactly. when my adoptive mom left at seven and they were, I felt safer. At, at, yes. at, it's weird. I, as we were talking, I thought about my brother, he was also adopted. And when he was five months old, uh, my mom was pregnant with twins. Um, but my brother never had a child or, you mm-hmm. know, it, it, he has, he's just kind of floating out there in the world, uh, with no biological connections. I, it made me think of him and have some yeah. compassion just now. Yes. Yeah. It, it is. It's really complicated. And it's always interesting to me too. When I talk to adopted men, there is a difference and there's a difference mm-hmm. sometimes in, I often, they, they will say they don't want to go searching because they feel super protective of their adoptive parents. Yeah. So they don't want to disrupt that. And there is almost kind of more of a reticence, which is interesting because I think of them as less emotionally vulnerable, which of course is not correct, but there is a, there's definitely a difference. Um, we've seen it too, interviewing guests. Yeah, right? we've, we've noticed. Yeah. And I, I mean, I wish someone would really ex- like scientifically explore that. Cause I also think, is it because men don't carry it, you know, physically bear a child in the same way and women do. And even whether, whether or not you have given birth to a child, maybe innately women have a different sort of sense of attachment or biology even or something. Um, yeah. It's all so interesting, right? I mean, it really is. Yeah. My, my brother did reach, he did do the search after I did the search. Um, and his, in the state where we were adopted in Missouri, the, the adoption agency said, well, both, both biological parents have to agree Mm -hmm. to have their information released and his biological mother said no. So he, you know, he, he just had so many abandoned, you know, yes. Which you're not going to jump back in there after that. Mm -mm. No, I have a question for you guys in terms of shutdowns. I mean, I definitely in many ways, both have times where I feel kind of shut down in Mm -hmm. certain areas and other times where I am, (laughs) you know, do you still have, I have, I mean, do you have that? Of course. Oh, yes. A hundred percent. I was, <laughs> We're like, I was yeah. just thinking <laughs> about this this weekend yeah. about feeling so shut down and, and disconnected in some yeah. way. Yeah. yeah. I have a, I have a really loving husband. Sarah's friends with him. He's wonderful. And thank God for him because I sometimes go into this place. Mm-hmm. It's, it's almost 
I wouldn't say worse, but I'm more aware of it now. So yeah, totally. Absolutely. I so mean, that's, I think, yeah. that's a blessing. Cause I can say I'm in this place, but he'll mm-hmm. see it and he'll be, and, and he's not adopted. He can't really get it yep. or, you know, and he's, he tries though, but thank God he's just kind about it because I do, I get very like, ah, uh, just, mm-hmm. I have to be away. I, I, I've set up my life. I, I haven't even said this before, uh, but I think I've set up my life to where I don't have to be emotionally accountable to anybody. Mm. I mean, my, my son is, uh, I mean, we talk every day. We're super right. close. I'm, I visit him often. So it's not that, but it's just in my life. Yeah. There's nobody I have to be that accountable to. Yeah. And I, I think that's some safety measure, I guess. Totally. I used to pick partners who were just emotionally not in some way or another, not available. hundred percent. Yeah. I mean, and I love that. I love that. Yeah, what a too. great quality because they weren't intrusive. They didn't, they didn't expect anything from me. And then as I sort of worked my way towards, I think wanting more of a connection, yeah. I still would pick people who are sort of emotionally unavailable and then get very frustrated. Um, and it doesn't, you know, it's funny because you can desire that connection, but also the difficulty in accounting for one's own unavailability. Right. That's, that's where I'm at now. And I can't believe I'm this age and so many years of therapy. A and thousand percent. Everything yeah. that yeah. awareness yeah. and yes. knowing this about myself. Yes. yes. It doesn't I change it. <laughs> I want to write this. I want to, I, I mean, I'm trying to figure out how to write something basically called like, I don't know who I am. Right. Like, yeah. How do you get to be this age? And not only still struggling with it, but in some ways it's almost like worse. It's it, almost I worse. Know. That's the yeah, because like yeah. as a younger person, you think you're going to find yourself or it's going to become clear. And then here I am like getting old, starting to actually get old. Yeah. Having a kid who's, you know, pretty much, I mean, on her way out of the house, maybe, she, maybe she even stormed out now and left it. I don't know. <laughs> so basic. Yeah. But, and I still don't know myself or I do, but I, I think parts that's, that are missing, yes. but just yes. are not communicating. I think that's part of it is, you know, Sarah and I have the, a little bit older, we met through our sons who are both yeah. mine's turning 24. Hers is 24. And that I think them being out now mm-hmm. really goes, well, who am I now? I mean, then that's a whole, I mean, yes, I'm married and I, but I feel very vulnerable and alone often and <laughs> yeah. in a very strange, strange yeah. and I'm close to my brother where we text every day, we yeah. call each other and I feel like this island sometimes it's just bizarre that you're saying that I'm like, oh, yeah, but I that think is a good so book. You need to write that book. <laughs> it's hard. Cause I think like, it's funny. To say, I don't know what to say. Um, and I think, you know, I always see adoption as really this microcosm of for lack of a word, standard developmental things, but that when you're adopted, it's like the, the electron microscope version that every piece of the search for one's identity or for developmental, like individuation or separation is heightened in the adoptee. And I think mm-hmm. probably when you, when, you know, when we look at people who, what does it mean to be an empty nester? And the you know, party goes, well, my life is over now, or, you know, I forgot to become a person or all of those things. But I think, I think it is heightened once again for us because it does bring up those questions that are fundamental about identity. What belongs yeah. to me? And mm-hmm. what am I entitled to? That's a big piece of it too. Because I don't think, I think for me as an adoptee, I was always given the impression that I was somehow entitled to nothing, that my right. job was to be there to, to attend to others and, and, you know, take care of my adoptive family and take care of my brother and, you know, make everyone else okay, regardless of what it did to me. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, we were born into, uh, certainly during the baby scoop era, I, you know, we were the answer to infertility problems or, oh. uh, you know, we were the object that that cured the infertility problems, which by the way, during those years, they didn't even deal with those issues. It's like, okay, let's just move on and get a, get a baby to, to band-aid the. Right. And interestingly often, yeah. And they didn't deal with those. They, I mean, within the couples it was not dealt with and it obviously was very fraught and complicated and and means different things to each person. You know, I have friends who, who, you know, had one child and then they, they, um, tried to have another and couldn't. And then the woman wanted to adopt and the husband was like, absolutely not. I I won't, I won't raise a child. That's not mine. And I think, and, and it's funny when the people tell you that and they know you're adopted, you're like, okay, that's, I've had had those conversations. Yeah. I've had a couple. Yeah. Yeah. 
Mm-mm. Like people go, I have friends of color. I have friends who are adopted. It's like, okay, hello. You know, and, and it's fascinating how people who do not have that as part of their experience are profoundly not attuned to any of it. Mm-hmm. Um, it just doesn't, it, it, it doesn't occur to them. And it doesn't occur to them that in some ways, things like holidays, family occasions, all those things might feel differently to us. Yeah. You know? And it's I, I was... in, in The Mistress's Daughter, I also write about a little bit, I have um, some adopted cousins who are black. And I remember as a kid being at like my great aunt's house and uh, they were from another city and they were coming to visit. And I was like trying to bond with them. And I'm like, you know, I'm adopted too. And they're like, no, you're not. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> no, I am. I really am. And I remember that made me feel bad too. And I'm like screaming down the stairs, mom, aren't I adopted? And they were like, yeah, you're adopted. You know, it's just like, and I'm like, see, I am. Because, you know, to them, like, how could a white kid in a white family be adopted? Yeah. You know? So that was also really interesting. You know, and I, I always think that, that on the one hand, the, the experiences where if you don't look like your family, on the one hand, the upside is it's really obvious you're adopted and no one's like pretending because um, people would always say to me, oh, you look so much like your mother. My mother and I would sort of wink at each other. But for me, it was a painful wink. It was like, eh. <laughs> you know, that's uh, actually true. That's I, yeah. that's a reverse thing to think about. But it's yeah. true. Yeah. Because you're, you're yeah. just kind of assumed. Yeah. And the confusion there is much more interior and not, it's not something that even like in a classroom or in a, you know, in a social setting, people need to pay attention to, um, you know, or they would whisper about it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That explains it. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. That explains (laughs) it. I got some of that from the neighborhood. Totally. In the neighborhood. Yes. Yes. I remember There's a kid up the street. I remember people telling my brother, well, that's not your real sister. Totally. He was five years older. So they were all in these bigger conversations and he'd get really mad. That is my, and then he'd go home and ask me, oh, is she my real sister? You know, it was confusing for him. A thousand percent. My, my daughter used to say that my adoptive parents were not her real grandparents. And I'm like, no, they are your real grandparents. Yeah. That, that doesn't carry forward, you know, but it's, it's super complicated. And then the weird thing is I will say, I have been loath to, um, talk to my biological child about what I know about my biological history, because in some ways I've not wanted her to be too interested in it because I feel like her family and our family is the family that I grew up in and live in. And my relationship to the biological family is not primary. And I don't want her to, in the, in the quest for family to, you know, get fixated on that. I've sort of done the same thing. And now I'm in a divergent with it where I want him to know both and it's it's very confusing the conversations I know (laughs) and he's protective of both well he's curious he wants to know I have a biological dad out there who's still alive so Mm -hmm. he's curious like oh I have a grandfather and all these relatives but then we're also very he was very close parents to my adoptive parents and and those are his grandparents. They were wonderful grandparents. Amazing. Absolutely. So, it, you know, you have, and he's carrying the guilt. I'm like trying to talk well, to him. You don't have exactly, to carry the guilt. You don't have to be guilty. Yeah. Right. But it's so interesting because it's exactly the, the way in which things are multi-generational. It does reverberate. Yes. Um, and yeah. we went, it's funny because recently, only very recently, have I sort of opened that door a little bit. And, and I took her, my daughter, last weekend, funny enough, to um, the, sort of literally the place where the ancestors from, I mean, from, you know, the 1600s had come from, and there's an archaeological dig going on and so on, and sort of introduced her to that history, because I thought that to me is very interesting, and it's not about the specific, more current personalities, yeah. right? But, but it also is risky. I mean, it's really intense, and I'm like, this is also yours, and what does that mean? Well, you feel disconnected. I haven't even been able to tell Sarah this because it's, it just happened last night, but a woman on ancestry contacted me. Like, how are you? Um, I won't say the last name, but how are you, your biological in this family? Right. Cause I see this totally. name and cause I'm researching the Arkansas group, which yeah. my biological mom side hails from Arkansas. Mm-hmm. And She's really a neat older woman, giving me all this information about people I see in the tree and yes, totally. pretty close, not, yes. not, you know, just grandparent and up, 
but I feel really disconnected from it too. Like who in Arkansas, you know, just this whole, which I know, I mean, I know some of this, but now to talk to her, I feel very disconnected from it too. I'm trying to connect feel, to it, but yeah, I don't know. It's, it's intense. I also feel scared when I tell them anything about myself that, that if they find out I'm illegitimate or I'm adopted, that then they will cut me out of that picture. Um, because mm. it, so that, you know, it, all of those things have their own meaning to other people. If you say, oh, I'm the child of, you know, my father's mistress, they could be like, oh yeah, that's, we don't want that in our family. We don't want that. Yeah, but that's I am dirty in your stuff. family, right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, so much of it, you know, the other piece of all of this is so much of our ability to gain knowledge about our history and to, and, and to engage with it is at the whim of others. Right. It's, yes. It's whether or not any one person decides I'm going to give that person the information, mm. I'm not going to tell them. I am going to see them. I'm not going to see them. And that part I find uh, psychologically very, very hard and very depressing because I feel like I can be negated or you can call it canceled or whatever, you know, whatever the word is at any moment, just because one person doesn't want that or could say within the family, hey, you know what? I don't think we should bring this. I don't know who this person is or there's some fancy writer from wherever. I don't think we <laughs> want to engage with them in that way. Yeah. And there I go, right? Yeah, there's no foundation for anything. No, and no obligation because there's no social structure that says, even though it's your family, you know, it, like it generally, like you're like, even though you don't like aunt so-and-so, you still have to be nice to her. <laughs> you right. Know? We don't, we don't, we aren't, we're not, I mean, we're truly not legitimate. And that's, that is a real, for me, an ongoing. And th then there's that, that whole right to know who you are with siblings. Sarah and I yes. talked about this. <clears throat> yes. I have two siblings out there, half siblings, mm -hmm. but so far, and this is all very new, but my biological dad, I don't think he's told anybody about me. Right. And now I'm on Ancestry and I'm sure they're like, who the heck's that? Right. And it, there hasn't really been any warmth in that way. And I don't think there will be. I just have right. a feeling. I have a gut feeling from just my small interaction that there won't be. So then you're like, oh, but I have a right to know the siblings. But do you, do they, you know, it's that weird. Am I going to just go it's around? It's a right between the siblings. If those, yes. if all siblings that's are agreeing upon it. it exactly. Yes. But, well, it, but when they don't know right. you, I have to circumvent the the dad right. in a right. very tight family. One thing I found out is they're very seven brothers with all their kids in one state that hang out together. You know what I'm saying? This is a tight group. It's not like yeah. a spread out. I've, I've kind right. of, so you're coming in like the back door is not the. Yeah. But I think that, that, I think even yeah. the, even that, the, that, the, a, the phrase, you know, that the, you right. Sort of, right. That you come in through the back door yeah, and you can't be direct. And it's, it is very complicated because I think yes. often one has to kind of navigate around a, a previous generation. Yeah. which is a generation that had more shame about it right. and or has their own feelings about whether it's a parent's behavior or how they yes. ended up in whatever situation. Yeah. Uh, and I noticed for myself, a couple of the people who I've been sort of chatting with an ancestry, having pieced together other pieces of the sort of family puzzle from other people, I realized two of these people, they don't know each other, but their parents were in a way outsiders in the family. So it's interesting to me that they are another generation and yet they are looking for pieces of the family and they probably don't know that their parents were outsiders in the family. Do you know what I mean? Because the, the parents probably didn't tell them the bad stories about how they ended up as outsiders in the family. Um, and so that to me is also really, really interesting. The outliers, everybody's yeah. the outlier. Yeah. Huh. Yeah. I, my birth mother was also adopted um, That's interesting. so after she died in 2009, I mean, she knew, and she gave me my birth father's name. Um, and I found out that he died. So now both of them are, but he had died in 1986 in Florida where I was living, um, at the time, but through ancestry, I found her, uh, biological family in Rochester and, um, she, her birth mother was from a family of five, six kids. So in Rochester, my grandmother was from a family of six kids and four of those kids gave away children for adoption. Isn't that yeah. so interesting? And do you have any sense of how that came to be? 
I found, I spoke to, yes. So I tracked all these people down. It's probably been about five years, four or five years now. Um, and I spoke to my second cousin. So my birth mother's cousin, and she yeah. had, you know, knew all the family stuff and right. just, uh, <laughs> while my ex was writing his historical fiction <laughs> book yeah. about his amazing family who knew, you know, uh, Einstein, right. you know, I find out I come from a long line of party girls. Right. <laughs> <laughs> That's a book. That's a book in itself. <laughs> so, yeah, it's just so, but so I am in touch and I was like, I guess, you know, fortunate that both my birth father's family and mm-hmm. her family kind of embraced and think right. of me as part of the family. Um, and I have lots yeah. of siblings that, uh, that I don't, I'm close I don't know to. what, um, uh, your sort of experience has been, but I, I find that it's, it's very interesting to me, the ways in which I'm both kind of fixated and fascinated in all the little pieces I can find of history. Mm. And that at the same time, I can never fully pull them together, nor do I fully feel, um, they both have clearly have meaning for me, but I can't even say what that meaning is. I don't even know kind of what to do with them. And I feel like all of it crowds me, but it doesn't give me clarity. Yeah. Which is. I like that. I like how you said that. I was telling Bill, my husband last night about this ancestry woman. Mm -hmm. So nice. She's just been a wealth of information. He's like, why haven't you told me all this? I'm like, I don't know. I don't know what to do with it. Like I literally look at it like, okay. And it overwhelms me and I put it away and come back to it and put it away and come back to it. And yeah. yeah. Well, it's like, we live this life for others in a way. And therefore it, it, like the shutting down, sometimes it's just too much. It's, right. it's too much. And I don't know what to do with it. And when I feel overwhelmed, then I just can't do anything. Um, but I feel like for me, yeah. it, that piece of it lately, the sort of the shutting down and the, and the sort of having lived life very much for others. And obviously those others are also, we're, as we're aging, they're really aging. And, yeah. you know, and that's, I mean, that's a different kind of empty nest, right? As you're, as you're, whether it's your adoptive or your biological parents are dying off. That question again of like stepping into oneself, I mean, I can't even find myself. I can't, I, you know, I, I have been so, I, I, and I wouldn't trust what I found to think, oh, is that actually me? Is that what I really want? Because it, nothing feels quite right. Mm-hmm. Um, I lost both my adoptive parents in the last few years and it really hit me that I'm like this person in the family now. Mm-hmm. And my older brother sort of has made me that person too, because just with his own life, what he socially, how he yeah. is, yes. he's very comfortable with that role for me too. Right. Yeah. And I'm like, I'm not the, how am I the adult? adult? I don't even, how am I yeah. navigating and making sure the birthday card gets sent to so-and-so or I'm that person. And I also think it's so weird. Like, and I'm talking to the relatives in other countries and I'm doing all that. And the, (laughs) and the birthdays, all of it, the mom, whatever. And then it's fascinating because I think these aren't even my relatives. I mean, they are, but I, and it's so weird and there's no one else doing it. It is weird. I I feel like I'm the one always keeping in touch with everybody and, and yeah. they'd feel sad to hear that. Cause I'm sure they're, they're just used to me yes, doing totally. it. Right. I'm one of the older like, ones. Yes. Yeah. And then they'll they'd say, be like, like, I'm sorry that you resent it. That's what I'm like, I <laughs> right. resent it. I just, it's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. I don't resent it either, but it was just yeah. the role because my brother and I are the oldest and you go down and somehow I'm the oldest, even though he's the oldest and that caretaker personality. Yes, I'm the same way. My brother is older yeah. than I am, but I'm the, I'm the oldest. Totally. Yeah. Me yeah. too. And it's just it's like, well, that's my role. Yeah. But it's a strange role. It's been very yeah. strange without my parents. And my parents were really opening up a lot about my adoption as they, as they got older. And I think I have relatives who are offended. I don't even know. I've never talked to them about it actually, who may be offended that Sarah and I do this podcast or not. Mm-hmm. Sure. Absolutely. But my parents, I don't think my parents would have been right. shockingly that that's the cool that same thing. experience. Absolutely. Yeah. That somehow yeah. my sort of being outward about some of it. Although it's funny because I remember when I wrote the memoir, I was terrified for my adoptive mother to read it. I wanted her to read it ahead of time. And if there was, and I purposely didn't write that much about my adoptive family. And she was like, oh, I think this is your best book yet. I'm so proud of you, whatever. But I really also thought it's interesting. The family is going to 
see things and hear things that they haven't heard before. Yeah. And they definitely are going to have feelings about it. Um, and they do, I'm sure. I don't think yes. I saw a cousin of mine recently at a funeral and he's like, I didn't know you were adopted because he's a lot younger yeah. and I blend in. Right. Right. And then his wife, I guess, told him about my podcast and he's like, it's really, it makes sense. Like all these little things for him made sense that didn't right. make sense. But, right. and for me, it made sense just that we had the conversation was so nice. I was like, oh, I'm finally talking to somebody about it and right. he's much younger. And so for him, it was no big deal, but right. yes. I recently moved back. To the <laughs> yeah, Midwest. Well, really I left nice. when I was 15, yeah. um, ran away from home and had trauma, but I recently moved back and, you know, my dad had gotten remarried when I was 12 and it was three years later that I left. So I, I didn't, my family dynamic. In fact, at one point I found a picture where they had, it was like one of those collages, you know, with everybody and they replaced my picture with the family house. Um, <laughs> she had a house in her place. Yes. <laughs> That's so, my favorite thing yet. Uh, so I really didn't have a defined role for 40 years being gone. And I, you know, I, I came back. I don't even know why I came back uh, part, partially, to be honest, it was to be closer to my son in Dallas uh -huh. without moving there. Right. Um, and then my, my adoptive mother is here, uh, and we're close, but at any rate, I have suddenly found myself feeling even less connected and, and having a place in that family because they went on for 40 years without me and right. established these lives. I'd come back a couple of times a year and visit and, you know, and I, I, so it just highlights in a weird way, my more outsider status on the planet, you know, and she's been going through this while we're reading the primal wound and the, the VJ Lifton's oh, book. Sense. I mean, yeah. you know, the other thing that, that I talk about a little bit of mistress's daughter, and I, I'd be curious about you guys, I'm always surprised at this doesn't change for me. You know what I mean? The, that I can get older and I can go through relationships and raise a child and, you know, theoretically sort of have a successful career and all this stuff. But I really hurt in some mm -hmm. way that people around me have no concept of. Um, and it doesn't, it doesn't, it, 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 regardless of if I win a prize, I'm like, that's nice, I want a prize, you know, but it doesn't touch that level of kind of, Primitive negation is what I would call it, you know? Um, that's a great way to put it. Gosh. That's a great way to put it. Well, maybe that's the book. I was just thinking that. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> it makes you know, me. It's funny too. It's like, do you guys have this? There's times I think I just don't want to think about it. It hurts. It doesn't feel good. And I, it's yes. hard, yeah. so hard to try to find language yeah. for any of it, right? Because you're like, oh, that's like, that's complicated. That's like a bunch of words you got to find. The funny thing is, is it makes me want to come through like the zoom camera and like hug you and oh, hug Sarah. And like then at the hugged. same time, I don't like to be hugged. I'm like, yeah, but I wouldn't want that. It's like a funny feeling though. It's like, but I, I feel like with adoptees, I'm safer. Totally. I totally. And I, and I do appreciate that. And I would accept yes, that. Right. Does that make sense? I don't, I mean, like in my this get, part, I'm like, please do not, you know, everyone right. gets a joke. It's like this. Yeah. yeah I was the push away girl, but it totally. makes me, I like want to, um, I don't know. I just feel like we're, we're just still yeah. kids and, and no one understands it. It's not like you can talk, you know, if you do talk about like people, have, people who aren't adopted have this feeling like, you know, it's been so long, just get over it. Let it go. <laughs> well, it's like that happened to you a long time ago. I'm like, yeah. oh, it's still happening. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I mean, didn't I even, think... I think we're just addressing it. That's yeah. the funny thing. I, yeah. I think we were so busy in our lives. We always had all this stuff. I just thought it was weird. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I thought internally I'm a little weird and nobody knows it. You know, right. I met Sarah. We could kind of be like, we're weird together. Right. You know, you thank right. God for Sarah. We've had long, I mean, this process with her, if I did this alone, it'd be very scary. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But we I have think each that's, other. Right. And that's also really important. And you know, it's funny when my kid was at school in elementary school, they had like an adopted parents group and it was mostly, there were a couple adoptees in it, but it was mostly people who had adopted children. And that was fascinating too to see that these were people who, what, you know, for whatever, whether they could or couldn't have children or whatever it was had adopted. And all of their anxieties about being an adoptive parent and being a good adoptive parent and all this stuff and hearing them talk about that, but then the few, and, and the few adoptees in there, we talked a bit, but we didn't talk that much. And 
it is interesting to realize that the parts that always you sort of think, oh, I, I, that part of me is weird. It's not, it's, it's, we, a lot of, I mean, we share a lot of the same things yeah. in that way. And I don't think we get to say that or, you know, have that validated as that it's not unique to us as, as individuals. It is part of the experience of being adopted. It is. It's been therapy for us to have guests to talk to you and, and our other guests have been, it's been very therapeutic that I, in ways I could have never imagined. Mm -hmm. And I I, I guess that those adoptive parents wouldn't necessarily want to hear the truth about how adoptees feel. And I think there's a lot of denial with adoptive parents or well, and it's scary to them. I mean, they, mm-hmm. they are trying their best and they obviously want the best for their child. And it's interesting too, because they want to believe that there is no difference between biology and adopted. And I would say there is a difference that doesn't make one bad or good, but there is a difference. And you have to, by, by not acknowledging the difference, you're actually causing more of a problem. Just the acknowledgement, I think, is the... Yeah. Yeah. Even when my mom was getting older and we had that between us, it was so healing just right. to, and then she told me about her pain. I don't think, you know, she never got to tell anybody. Of course, They just, you know, she told my dad, but he was a young man. He couldn't figure that out. He was balancing a new family. And, you know, I think that it was just like, you're okay now move on. Totally. You Absolutely. Know? And I had that in my family with the child who died. He was a child from my mom's previous marriage. So I think she felt that she had to sort of, and she was in a new marriage, that she had to shovel that grief away. And so I would hear about it. I'm like, you know, and it'd be like, oh, today's the birthday. I'm like, oh, like, you know, as a kid, and you're just like, oh, hey, you know, like, you know, uh, it's a lot. Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. One more burden to to carry. It's a job. I mean, that's the thing too, that no one tells you, you know, being adopted is a job. It is. It really is. And child labor laws just are not being obeyed at all. <laughs> um, yeah. We get to end on a moment of levity. <laughs> it is such a treat to meet you guys and to talk and, and really just, and it, it's wonderful that, that you guys are out there talking to people and, and, you know, sort of, I don't know, you know, bringing some of the stuff a little bit more out into the open and sort of letting people know that there are all varieties of experiences And there's not a, there's not a right or wrong way to be adopted, or you know, to talk about it. Yeah. I, I agree with you. There's so many different levels and layers and people's stories and and people who don't want to look, as you said, or search, that's okay too. Maybe they listen and just bond a little and oh yeah. Yeah. That's big. This is wonderful for Sarah and I. Uh, treat. Well, so happy to we finally can always talk more again we don't have to record it we can do whatever <laughs> yes uh. I, I do exist in reality not just in the basement <laughs> we're happy to know and good Thanks. luck today with with uh your daughter thank you <laughs> i yeah, like her already i like her spirit upstairs. right exactly i just like her gumption to pull out the name you know <laughs> you know that's what they do they have and she and it's funny too i mean the one thing about having a daughter as you think, you know, okay, so part of my job as a mom is not to sort of shut her down in some ways, right? Because you want young women to be feisty and be able to advocate yeah. for themselves. This one is so peppery. You know, it's just like, <laughs> oh my God. Okay. But yeah. But she, she's going to take over the world and I love it. We need more daughters. And then when her. I say that, like, if you're going to take over the world, she goes, mom, lower your expectations. <laughs> We all have them on her. Come on. Does she, does she call mama? Does she talk like mama? Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Yes. And she's still, she's 19 and she says, feed me. I'm like, okay, you must eat when you're at school by by yourself. That never ends by the way. I know. know, know. Well, it's a reverting back, you know, even when when my son comes to visit, he's like a child again. I know. It's It's fascinating. And we just feed them. Can I get you something? Let me, I love it. I go back into my role and then I, then I go through grief again when he leaves. Cause I miss having that role. I start asking he and his girlfriend, if I can do their laundry. And he's like, it's so funny. I do their laundry. I do. Yeah. The other day I was like folding the boyfriend's clothes and I was like, okay. (laughs) I actually kind of liked that. I thought it was sweet. I do too. I I like like it too. I miss having that purpose. 
Yeah, I'm actually weirdly good at laundry. They call me like the stain wizard. So. <laughs> I was going to say my thing's stains. cleaning. I'm a yeah. cleaning. I'm, I'm the That's cleaner. a whole other podcast. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. What are our anxieties and what do we do? Well, such uh, a really thank you guys. And, thank and you so things. much. Let's for sure stay in touch. Yes. 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 Um, all right. More than more to come is all I will say. That, exactly. We can always have a part two. Yes. <laughs> thank Anytime. you. Anytime. Sure. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Bye. Bye. Bye.